Hello, my name is Stephen Mythen. I'm an archaeologist at the University of Reading in the UK. I'm interested in the relationship between language, thought, music, and the brain. I'm interested in these because we don't understand the nature of being human unless we understand the configuration between these. But I'm also interested because unless we understand how these interact, we don't understand the nature of prehistoric behaviour in the past. And if we don't understand the past, we don't understand how the present has come into being. Music and language are universals in the modern world. But what is their relationship? When and how did they arise? And what is their relationship with the brain and with thought? Now, in these few images here, you can immediately appreciate the close connection between music and language. If you listen to the oratory of Barack Obama, or if you listen to a mother interacting with her baby or child, you immediately recognise that spoken language partly communicates by its musicality, by its use of rhythm and pitch. And also looking at these images, you can see a very close relationship between spoken language and gesture and music. Obama, the mother, the baby, Mick Jagger, Simon Rattle, the conductor, they're all using gesture as an integral part of their communication. And also, we can recognise that language and music are fundamentally social activities. Obama is talking to probably millions of people. And as he does so, he's building up a relationship with those, just as a mother is with her baby. And of course, when people play together, whether in a rock band or in a symphony orchestra, those people are working very closely together to almost merge themselves as an individual to become one single musical entity. Now, these aren't just features of Western language and music, the universal, illustrated by the drummer on the left-hand side there. And that also illustrates another important aspect about the visual presence of making music and language. His body decoration has similarities, I think, with that of the Rolling Stones. And you can see that the suit of Obama or the dinner jackets of the orchestra are integral to the messages that they are communicating. Now, music and language are discussed in a wide range of disciplines that makes the study challenging. Anthropology, archaeology, linguistics, musicology, neuroscience, developmental psychology, and so forth. There is also a very long history, a long debate about the relationship between music and language. Now, most people listening today will be very familiar with the work of people such as Derek Bickerton and Noam Chomsky, and more recently, Robin Dunbar. And most accounts go back to Charles Darwin. I'm as interested in some of the earliest writers. Gian Battista Vico, writing in the 17th century, was one of the first to write about language and the nature of language. And he was one of the first to suggest that thought was essentially verbal in nature. And he argued that thoughts really were a mixture of almost dreamlike associations of ideas. He emphasised the role of analogy and metaphor in, in, in human thinking. And that connects with our modern ideas about cognitive blending and fluidity. Then Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, he argued that the inception of language was essentially musical in character, driven by emotion rather than rationality. And he also argued that language developed in southern warm climates, which has an amazing resonance, I think, with today, when many of us would see the origin of language being with Homo sapiens in the Middle Stone Age in Africa. And then Johann Gottfried Herder, writing a little bit later in the 18th century, he was one of the first to really emphasise how language was a distinguishing feature of humans against all of their other animals. And that, of course, is a debate that goes on. As some argue that language is special to Homo and no linguist, linguistic aspects are found in, say, chimpanzees or other primates. And some would argue that language is special just to Homo sapiens or even just a small number of Homo sapiens. So his ideas of the 18th century also remain very pertinent. And he also argued that language underpinned cultural diversity in the world, 
the language that you spoke influenced the way you think, the way you behave, and the culture you have, which also resonates with some modern ideas. So dealing with music, language, and, and, and the brain, we have to, I think, look as much back to those early writers as we do to modern neuroscience, as I'll do in this short presentation. Now, my challenge as an archaeologist is to recognise when language appears in the archival record. The archival record is of objects and fossils, and they're all absolutely silent. Now, some would argue that we can look at the technical complexity of early stone tools, such as that fine hand axe or Levalwa tool. And the technical skills of how these were manufactured, requiring some degree of planning, hierarchical thought, imply for some a linguistic capability. And some argue that to transfer that technical skill from one generation to the next would have required verbal instruction. Now, I personally don't believe any of that at all. Others look towards the associations we find between stone tools and animal bones on archaeological sites, as we see being excavated there, and argue that suggests we've got a group of hominins working together, sharing food, living in a social group, and that sociality would imply linguistic skills. Interesting argument, but again, personally, I don't take it. Now, the fossil record is interesting because one might look at if they look towards anatomical adaptations for language. And many have argued that going right back to Homo erectus is the capability there to produce complex verbal utterances. Now, I'm sure that's correct, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then we also have the brain size. What were these large brains of hominins, especially after about 500,000 years ago, being used for? If it wasn't for language, I'll come back to that issue too. And then we have symbolic activity in the Arsh record. Now, that is very difficult to recognise, and there's many debates about whether Neanderthals use symbols or not. We see clear symbols in, say, the artefacts from Blombos Cave dated to 80,000 years ago, or in prehistoric cave paintings. But a big issue is whether the use of visual symbols also implicates use of audible symbols, as in words. So recognising language from the fossil and the archival record is certainly not very easy to do. Now, to my mind, that evidence gives us an enormous paradox. If we look at the fossil record, I think it's undeniable that by 500,000 years ago, or possibly much earlier, there was the capability in humans to make really complex vocal utterances. Looking at the skeletons of Homo erectus, as we have there, we can see there was ability to control breathing. There was ability to make a wide range of vocal utterances using oral cavities and the vocal cords. And by looking at ear bones, we can recognize that a wide range of pitches could be perceived. And then we have this issue of the large brain. What is that large brain you being used for? if it's not for what we think is the most complex cognitive capability we have, which is making language. The dilemma, however, is as we look at the behavior of these early humans, such as Homo erectus and Heidelbergensis, as its anatomy and brain size are evolving, we don't see any fundamental change in behavior. The stone artifacts, the hunting methods look much the same. So if language is really the driver of cultural change, why don't we see any change at that time? The only time we do see a really fundamental change in the Ark's record in human behavior is around 100,000 years ago. This is when a strain of modern humans evolved in Africa. It's when you find the first use of pigments and graphic designs, especially in South Africa. And as soon after this, the Homo sapiens disperses into Eurasia, a remarkable global disperser. Uh, into South Asia, then building boats and traveling to Australasia, colonizing northern lands into Arctic tundras of Beringia, crossing into the Americas, and then all the way down the Americas through the, into the Amazonian rainforest into Tel del Fuego, and into Europe. And as they dispersed around the world, we know that other humans rapidly went extinct. Now, there may have been some interbreeding, but nevertheless, those others 
humans as distinct species became extinct. Now, that seems to me a sign of language, that behavioral change. So how can you equate that language evolving after 100,000 years ago with the anatomical evidence that complex vocal utterances and large brains were present at least 500,000 years ago, if not significantly more? Well, I tried to do that in my 2005 book, The Singing Neanderthals. I was very drawn to the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Charles Darwin, and more particularly, the ethnomusicologist John Blacking, who in 1973 had written about a pre-linguistic mode, musical mode of thought and action. And I characterised the communications of early humans as being holistic, manipulative, multimodal. That's a lot of use of body language. Musical, making use of variations in pitch and rhythm and timbre and mimetic. And that form of communication system, I think, delivered the social bonding that was required. It enabled the transfer of information. It required the large brain. And it continued throughout the human lineage that led to the Neanderthals in Europe. In Africa, however, at around 100,000 years ago, for a reason that we don't fully understand, there was a bifurcation in this communication method at some time around 100,000 years ago. And that led to the two methods of communication we have today, music and language. And I think that occurred through some sort of segmentation of holistic phrases, which in essence means the invention of words. Now, in a previous book, I'd also explained the cognitive impact of that. If we look at humans epitomized by the Neanderthals, who depended on that musical mode of thought and action. I think this prevented them from bringing together their cognitive skills for, say, making stone tools or thinking about nature or engaging with other individuals. I think without the concepts provided by words, they had very limited abilities to innovate and for symbolism. They weren't entirely absent, but they were very limited. And consequently, we see this remarkable cultural stability in the archival record of non-modern Homo sapiens. In contrast, those Homo sapiens in Africa who invented words and evolved language were able to build up new and complex concepts in their minds because they were anchored by words and they could be communicated to others by words. This gave them the um, characteristic that I called cognitive fluidity an ability to combine together ways of thinking and stores of knowledge that previously been isolated. And we can really see the impact of this after the end of the Ice Age, when the, in conditions of climatic stability and relative warmth, agriculture was invented in numerous parts of the world. Soon after that, towns and trade, and then civilizations. And within a mere 10,000 years, We've moved from living as in localized bands of hunter gatherers to being part of a global community connected by in a digital world. Now, that is the true power of language. That is what language has delivered. Now, I want to um, comment on those ideas by briefly remarking on two recent theories of language evolution um, that have been recently published and argue that these are erroneous or not as strong as they could be because they then neglect the role of music. So Derek Bickerton, a linguist who's made profound contributions to understanding of language evolution, very sadly passed away a few years ago, but in his last book called More Than Nature Needs, he developed his previous arguments that words came first or proto-words and that these evolved or invented, it's not quite clear what he means, by about one and a half million years ago to communicate about displaced entities in the world. He said it was obvious that words came first. That isn't obvious to me at all. He said these were like beads on a string because they'd yet to have syntax or grammar to arrange them in particular ways to provide additional value to their meaning. What seems absent in this theory is that it implies there was almost silence in that common in world before words were invented. But we know that hominins must have had derived vocalizations from the ape-like ancestors. If we look at 
chimpanzees as an analogy for the much earlier Australopithecines, we know that had complex vocalizations. So these words, if words were invented then, must have been embedded into that complex vocalization. And I think Bickerton uh, ignores that to his cost. Now, a very different view has come from Chomsky and Robert Berwick. In a series of articles and a book called Why Only Us, they have reduced the complexity of grammar to a single operator called merge. And they argue merge is a cognitive process that allows cognitive atoms, as they call it, to be packaged together and then arranged hierarchically to be used recursively to create sentence-like thoughts. What they argue is that words came after that. So we created this complex way of thinking using merge and only let, later became able to express that with words. Now that seems a very strange idea, partly because of their claim that this happened by a single genetic mutation and partly because what would be the point of having those complex thoughts if you can't express them to anybody? Why would they give you any survival value at all? But what I like about their ideas is that they argue that grammar, as in merge, evolved before the use of words. Now, I think that engages with two other really interesting pieces of academic development. One is the great emphasis produced in recent work on the role of music and social bonding. Now, a major project led by Patrick Savage, to which I contributed, was published in 2021 in Behavioural and Brain Sciences, that reaffirmed the role of music as social bonding, as being its prime function. And as such, it implies it has deep evolutionary roots, because we know that social bonding was critical to humans living in the past. And there's been very strong arguments that sociality is the driving force of brain enlargement. Then equally important has been the work of uh, Ani Patel and Stefan Krush in arguing about the overlap of processing of music and language in the brain. Now, Kosh in particular has demonstrated that when we listen to music, our brain's process is hierarchical syntactical structure in just the same way that we process language. Now, I find that absolutely fascinating because I think that implies that Chomsky's merge process is actually being present for use of processing music as well as language. So with that, we can return to the scenario that I suggested earlier and rather develop that, I think, by drawing on that social bonding of music and the notion of merge. So in this slightly developed scenario on the, on the right there, I'd maintain the view that musicality was selected as a means of communication for social bonding, primarily among our early human ancestors, going right back to the Australopithecines and Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis and Neanderthals. Musicality was not only used for social bonding, but also for mate competition and information transfer. Now that involved cognition for processing the hierarchically organized information within music. And as Kors has demonstrated, that uses cognitive processes that are very similar to what we use for language, which I'd equate to what Chomsky is talking about with merge. So grammar that we then used for language came first before the intention of words. And then sometime around 100,000 years ago, community of homo sapiens in Africa, I think invented the idea of words. And when words were combined with that grammatical power of merge, that's the time when language appears, it emerges. And then the ongoing invention of words, the ongoing development of grammar, developed not only language, but also culture change and diversity through time. And it continues to do so today with the invention of words being a really driving force of culture and thought. To conclude, I'll go back to these four domains of thought, language, music, and brain. My view is that these are intimately connected in the modern mind. From an evolutionary point of view, the large brains drove sociality, and they were acquired communication, which was musical in nature. That led to the selection of cognitive processes that could process hierarchically complex uh, sounds, as we call in musicality, as Kloch has argued. 
And then when words were invented, they drew then on those hierarchical processes to create a new phenomena called language, just in Homo sapiens. And that transformed, formed human thought into the cognitive fluid ideas that we have today, just the same, same type that Vico wrote about in the 17th century. And it also generated the cultural diversity that Herder wrote about in the 18th century. So I think those early writers have a lot to contribute to how we think about language today and music arising from this very recent work in psychology and neuroscience. Thank you.